Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe, read by Christopher M. Wallace for LibriVox.org. It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. And this maiden, she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child, and she was a child, in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love. I and my Annabelle Lee with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabelle Lee, so that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me, to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we, and neither the angels in heaven above, nor the demons down under the sea, can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And so, all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in the sepulcher there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Apology by Amy Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Heidi Pack Be not angry with me that I bear your colors everywhere, all through each crowded street, and meet the wonder light in every eye as I go by. Each plodding wayfarer looks up to gaze, blinded by rainbow haze, the stuff of happiness, no less, which wraps me in its glad-hued folds of peacock golds. Before my feet the dusty, rough-paved way flushes beneath its gray. My steps fall ringed with light, so bright it seems a myriad suns are strewn about the town. Around me is the sound of steepled bells, and rich, perfumed smells hang like a wind-forgotten cloud and shroud me from close contact with the world. I dwell impearled. You blazon me with jeweled insignia, a flaming nebula rims in my life. And yet you set the word upon me, unconfessed to go unguessed. End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. The Atlantic by Edward Doyle Read for LibriVox.org by Aidan Herrera Forming the Great Atlantic See God take the mist from woe's white mountain Spring and stream The breath of man in frost The spiral lean From roof-cracked caves where, though my heart may break The soul will not lie torpid like the snake And battle smoke on them he breathes with dream And lo, an angel with a sword agleam Twixt the old world and new for justice's sake. What sea so broad as that from human weeping, Or sun so flaming as the angel's sword, Of human and divine wills in accord, There, with sword flash of myriad waves, Joy weeping shall wound forever, Freedom's watch and ward, With the new world in his seraphic keeping. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Benjamin Painter by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Tom Merritt Together in this grave lie Benjamin Painter, Attorney at Law, and Nig his dog, Constant companion, solace, and friend. Down the gray road, friends, children, men and women, Passing one by one out of life, left me till I was alone with Nig for partner, bedfellow, comrade, and drink. In the morning of life I knew aspiration and saw glory. Then she, who survives me, snared my soul with a snare which bled me to death, till I, once strong of sill, lay broken, indifferent, living with Nig in a room back of a dingy office. Under my jawbone is snuggled the bony nose of Nig, our story is lost in silence. Go by, mad world. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Benjamin Painter by Edgar Lee Masters Read for LibriVox.org by Tricia G. I know that he told how I snared his soul with a snare which bled him to death and all the men loved him, and most of the women pitied him. But suppose you are really a lady, and have delicate tastes, and loathe the smell of whiskey and onions, and the rhythm of Wordsworth's ode runs in your ears, while he goes about from morning till night, repeating bits of that common thing, Oh, why should the spirit of mortal be proud? And then, suppose, you are a woman well endowed, and the only man with whom the law and morality permit you to have the marital relation is the very man that fills you with disgust every time you think of it, while you think of it every time you see him. That's why I drove him away from home to live with his dog in a dingy room back of his office. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. KC at the Bat by Ernest Lawrence Thayer Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Chenevere It looked extremely rocky for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood four to six with just an inning left to play. And so, when Cooney died at first and Burroughs did the same, a pallor wreathed the features of the patrons of the game. A straggling few got up to go, leaving there the rest, with that hope that springs eternal within the human breast. For they thought if only Casey could get one whack at that, they'd put up even money with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, and so likewise did Blake. But the former was a pudding, and the latter was a fake. So on that stricken multitude a death-like silence sat, for there seemed but little chance of Casey's getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and the much-despised Blakey tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted and they saw what had occurred, there was Blakey safe on second, 
and Flynn a hugging third. Then from the gladdened multitude went up a joyous yell. It bounded from the mountain top and rattled in the dell. It struck upon the hillside and rebounded on the flat. For Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was an ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearing, and a smile on Casey's face, and when, responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat, no stranger in the crowd could doubt twas Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. Five thousand tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. Then, while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance glanced in Casey's eye, a sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood a-watching it, haughty grander there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. "'That ain't my style,' said Casey. "'Strike one,' the umpire said. From the benches, black with people, there went up a muffled roar, like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. "'Kill him! Kill the umpire!' shouted someone in the stand. And it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand." With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult. He bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the spheroid flew. But Casey still ignored it. And the umpire said, Strike two! Fraud! cried the maddened thousands. And the echo answered, Fraud! But the scornful look from Casey and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold, they saw his muscles strain, and they knew that Casey wouldn't let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip, his teeth are clenched with hate, he pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate, and now the pitcher holds the ball and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright, the band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dark Spirit of the Desert Rude by Percy Shelley. Read for LibriVox.org by Lita Campbell. Dark Spirit of the Desert Rude, that o'er this awful solitude, each tangled and untrodden wood, each dark and silent glen below, where sunlight's gleamings never glow. Whilst jetty, musical and still, In darkness speeds the mountain rill, The orion-broken peak sublime, Wild shapes that mock the scythe of time, And the pure Ellen's foamy course, Wavest thy wand of magic force. Art thou yon sooty and fearful fowl, That flaps its wings o'er the leafless oak, That o'er the dismal scene doth scowl, And mocketh music with its croak? I've sought thee where day's beams decay On the peak of the lonely hill. I've sought thee where they melt away By the wave of the pebbly rill. I've strained to catch thy murky form Bestride the rapid and gloomy storm. Thy red and sullen eyeballs glare Has shot in a dream through the midnight air. But never did thy shape express Such an emphatic gloominess. And where art thou, O thing of gloom, On nature's unreviving tomb? Where sapless, blasted, and alone, She mourns her blooming centuries gone. From the fresh sod that violets peep, The buds have burst their frozen sleep, Whilst every green and peopled tree Is alive with earth's sweet melody. But thou alone art here, Thou desolate oak, whose scathed head For ages has never trembled, 
whose giant trunk dead lichens bind, moaningly sighing in the wind, with huge loose rocks beneath thee spread, thou, thou alone art here, remote from every living thing, tree, shrub, or grass, or flower, thou seemest of this spot the king, and with a regal power, suck like that race all sap away, and yet upon the spoil decay. End of Dark Spirit of Desert Rude by Percy Shelley. This recording is in the public domain. Exeunt Omnes by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox.org by Libby Gone. Everybody else then going, and I still left where the fair was. Much have I seen of neighbor loungers making a lusty showing each now past all knowing there is an air of blankness in the street and the littered spaces thoroughfare steeple bridge and highway wizen themselves to lankness kennels dribble dankness folk all fade and whither as i wait alone where the fair was into the clammy and numbing night fog whence they entered hither Soon do I follow thither. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Fool Errant by Amy Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Laurie Arsenault The Fool Errant sat by the highway of life and his gaze wandered up and his gaze wandered down a vigorous youth but with no wish to walk yet his longing was great for the distant town he whistled a little frivolous tune which he felt to be pulsing with ecstasy for he thought that success always followed desire such a very superlative fool was he a maiden came by on an ambling mule her gown was rose-red and her kerchief blue. On her lap she carried a basket of eggs. Thought the fool, there is certainly room for two. So he jauntily swaggered towards the maid and put out his hand to the bridle rein. My pretty girl, quoth the fool, take me up, for to ride with you to the town I am fain. But the maiden struck at his upraised arm and pelted him hotly with eggs a score. The mule, lashed into a fury, ran. The fool went back to his stone and swore. Then out of the cloud of settling dust the burly form of an abbot appeared. Reading his office he rode to the town, and the fool got up, for his heart was cheered. He stood in the midst of the long white road and swept off his cap till it touched the ground. Ah, reverend sir, well met said the fool a worthier transport never was found i pray you allow me to mount with you your palfrey seems both sturdy and young the abbot looked up from the holy book and cried out in anger hold your tongue how dare you obstruct the king's high road you saucy varlet get out of my way then he gave the fool a cut with his whip and leaving him smarting he rode away the fool was angry, the fool was sore, and he cursed the folly of monks and maids. If I could but meet with a man, sighed the fool, for a woman fears and a friar upbraids. Then he saw a flashing of distant steel, and the clanking of harness greeted his ears, and up the road journeyed knights at arms, with waving plumes and glittering spears. The fool took notice and slowly arose. Not quite so sure was his foolish heart. If priests and women would none of him, was it likely a knight would take his part? They sang as they rode, these lusty boys, when one chanced to turn toward the highway's side. There's a sorry figure of fun, jested he. Well, sirrah, move back. There is scarce room to ride. Good sirs, kind sirs, begged the crestfallen fool, I pray of your courtesy speech with you. I'm for yonder town and have no horse to ride. 
have you never a charger will carry to then the company halted and laughed out loud was such a request ever made to a knight and where are your legs asked one if you start you may be inside the town gates to-night tis a lazy fellow let him alone they've no room in the town for such idlers as he but one bent from his saddle and said my man art thou not ashamed to beg charity thou art well set up and thy legs are strong but it much misgives me lest thou art a fool for beggars get only a beggar's crust wise men are reared in a different school then they clattered away in the dust and the wind and the fool slunk back to his lonely stone he began to see that the man who asks must likewise give and not ask alone purple tree shadows crept over the road the level sun flung an orange light and the fool laid his head on the hard gray stone and wept as he realized advancing night a great round moon rose over a hill and the steady wind blew yet more cool and crouched on a stone a wayfarer sobbed for at last he knew he was only a fool end of poem this recording is in the public domain Hope is the Thing with Feathers by Emily Dickinson Read for the LibriVox.org by Itel Bus Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all and sweetest and the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could bash the little bird that kept so many warm I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Kubla Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge Read by Christopher M. Wallace for LibriVox.org In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea so twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree and here were forests ancient as the hills Enfolding sunny spots of greenery. But oh, that deep romantic chasm Which slanted down the green hill Athwart a cedarn cover. A savage place as holy and enchanted As e'er beneath the waning moon was haunted By woman wailing for her demon lover. And from this chasm, with ceaseless turmoil seething, As if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing, A mighty fountain momently was forced, Amid whose swift half-intermitted burst, Huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail, or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail. And mid these dancing rocks at once and ever it flung up momently the sacred river. Five miles meandering with a mazy motion 
Through wood and dale the sacred river ran, Then reached the caverns measureless to man, And sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean. And mid this tumult Kubla heard from far Ancestral voices prophesying war. The shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves. Where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain and the caves? It was a miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice, a damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. It was an Abyssinian maid. And on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Abora. Could I revive within me her symphony and song? To such a deep delight twit win me, that with music loud and long, I would build that dome in air, that Sunny dome, those caves of ice, and all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, Beware, beware, his flashing eyes floating hair, weave a circle around him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread, for he on honeydew hath fed, and drunk the milk of paradise. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Learning to Read by Francis E. W. Harper Read for LibriVox.org by Natalia Godwin Very soon the Yankee teachers came down and set up school. But oh, how the Rebs did hate it. It was again their rule. Our masters always tried to hide book learning from our eyes. Knowledge didn't agree with slavery, twould make us all too wise, but some of us would try to steal a little from the book and put the words together and learn by hook or crook. I remember Uncle Caldwell, who took pot liquor fat and greased the pages of his book and hid it in his hat, and had his master ever seen the leaves up on his head, he'd have thought them greasy papers, but nothing to be read. And there was Mr. Turner's Ben, who heard the children spell and picked the words right up by heart, and learned to read them well. Well, the northern folks kept sending the Yankee teachers down, and they stood right up and helped us, though Rebs did sneer and frown. And I longed to read my Bible, for precious words had said, but when I begun to learn it, folks just shook their heads and said, there's no use trying. Oh, Chloe, you're too late. But as I was rising sixty, I had no time to wait. So I got a pair of glasses, and straight to work I went, and never stopped till I could read the hymns and testament. Then I got a little cabin, a place to call my own, and I felt as independent as the queen upon her throne. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Leonardo's Mona Lisa by Edward Dowden Read for LibriVox.org by Capricia Page 
Make thyself known, Sibyl, or let despair of knowing thee be absolute. I wait hour long and waste a soul. What word of fate hides twixt the lips which smile and still forbear? Sweet perfection, mystery too fair. Tangle the sense no more, lest I should hate the delicate tyranny, the inviolate poise of thy folded hands, the fallen hair. Nay, nay, I wrong thee with rough words. Still be serene, victorious, inaccessible. Still smile, but speak not. Lightest irony lurk ever neath thy eyelid's shadow. Still or top our knowledge. Sphinx of Italy, allure us and reject us at thy will. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Music I Heard by Conrad Eichen. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. Music I heard with you was more than music, and bread I broke with you was more than bread. Now that I am without you, all is desolate. All that was once so beautiful is dead. Your hands once touched this table and this silver, and I have seen your fingers hold this glass. These things do not remember you, beloved, and yet your touch upon them will not pass. For it was in my heart you moved among them, and blessed them with your hands and with your eyes, and in my heart they will remember always. They knew you once, O oh, beautiful and wise. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mute Opinion by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Jackson Bates I traversed a dominion whose spokesmen spake out strong, their purpose and opinion through pulpit, press, and song. I scarce had means to note there a large-eyed few and dumb, who thought not as those thought there that stirred the heat and hum. When, grown a shade, beholding that land in lifetime trode, to learn if its unfolding fulfilled its clamoured code, I saw, in web unbroken, its history outwrought, not as the loud had spoken, but as the mute had thought. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Old Souls by Thomas Gordon Hake Read for LibriVox.org by Capricia Page The world, not hushed, lay as in trance. It saw the future in its van, and drew its riches in advance to meet the greedy wants of man, till length of days, untimely sped, left its account unaudited. The sun, untired, still rose and set, swerved not an instant from its beat. It had not lost a moment yet, nor used in vain its light and heat. But as in trance from when it rose to when it sank, man craved repose. A holy light that shone of yore he saw, despised and left behind. His heart was rotting to the core, locked in the slumbers of the mind. Not beat of drum nor sound of fife could rouse it to a sense of life. A cry was heard, intoned and slow, of one who had no wares to vend. His words were gentle, dull, and low. And he called out, Old souls to mend. He peddled on from door to door, and looked not up to rich or poor. His step kept on as if in pace with some old timepiece in his head, nor ever did its way retrace, nor right nor left turned he his tread, but uttered still his tinker's cry to din the ears of passers-by. 
So well they knew the olden note, few heeded what the tinker spake, though here and there an ear it smote, and seemed a sudden hold to take. But they had not the time to stay, and it would do some other day. Still on his way the tinker wins, though jobs be far between and few. But here and there a soul he mends, and makes it look as good as new. Once set to work, once fairly hired, his dull old hammer seems inspired. Over the task his features glow, he knocks away the rusty flakes, a spark flies off at every blow, at every rap new life awakes. The soul once cleansed of outward sins, his subtle handicraft begins. Like iron unannealed and crude, the soul is plunged into the blast, to temper it, however rude, tis next in holy water cast. Then on the anvil it receives the nimblest stroke the tinker gives. The tinker's task is at an end, stamped was the cross by that last blow. Again his cry, old souls to mend, is heard in accents dull and low. He pauses not to seek his pay, that too will do another day. One stops and says, This soul of mine has been a tidy piece of wear, but rust and rot in it combine, and now corruption lays it bare. Give it a look. There was a day when it the morning hymn could say. The tinker looks into his eye, and there detects besetting sin, the decent, old established lie that creeps through all the chinks within. Lank are its tendrils, thick its shoots, and like a worm's nest coil the roots. Like flowers that deadly berries bear, his seed, if tended from the pond, has grown in beauty with the year, like a diodria drawn to God. Now, like a dank and curly brake, it fosters venom for the snake. The tinker takes the weed in tow and roots it out with tooth and nail, his labor patient to bestow, lest, like the herd of men, he fail. How best to extirpate the weed has grown with him into a creed. His tack is steady, slow, and sure. He plucks it out despite the howl, with gentle hand and look demure, as cunning maiden draws a fowl. He knows the job he is about and pulls till all the lie is out. Now steadfastly regard the man who wrought your cure of rust and rot. You saw him ere the work began. Is he the same, or is he not? You saw the tinker, now behold the envoy of a god of old. This said, he on the forehead stamps the downward stroke, and one across. Then straight upon his way he tramps, his time for profit, not for loss. His task no sooner at an end than out he cries, old souls to mend. As night comes on he enters doors, he crosses halls, he goes upstairs, he reaches first and second floors, still busied on his own affairs. None stop him, or a question ask, none heed the workman at his task, despite his cry, old souls to mend which into dull expression breaks. Not moved are they, nor ear they lend, to him who from old habit speaks. Yet does the deep and one-toned cry send thrills along eternity. He gads where outdoor wretches walk, where outcasts under arches creep. Among them holds his simple talk. He lets them hear him in their sleep. They who his name have still denied, he lets them see him crucified. On royal steps he takes a stand to light the beauties to the ball. He holds a lantern in his hand and lets the simple saying fall. They deem him but some sorry wit, serving the Holy Spirit's writ. They know not souls can rest and rot, and deem him, while he says his say, the tipsy watchman who forgot to call out, Carriage stop the way. They know not what it can pretend, This mocking cry, old souls to mend. 
while standing on the palace stone he is in the workhouse brothel jail he is to play in ballroom gone to hear again the beauty's rail with tender pity to behold the dead alive in pearls and gold in meaning deep in whispers low as bubble bursting on the air he lets the solemn morning flow through jeweled ear of creatures fair who while they dance their paces blend with his mild words old souls to mend and when to church their sins they take and bring them back to lunch again and fun of empty sermons make he whispers softly in their train and sits with them if two or more think of a promise made of yore of those who stay behind to sup and in remembrance eat the bread he leads the conscience to the cup his hands across the table spread when contrite hearts before him bend glad are his words old souls to mend the little ones before the font he clasps within his arms to bless for childhood's pure and guileless front smiles back his own sweet gentleness of such he says my kingdom is for they betray not with a kiss he goes to hear the vicars preach they do not always know his face him they pretend the way to teach and as one absent ask his grace not then his words old souls to mend their spirits pierce or bosoms rend he goes to see the priests revere his image as he lay in death they do not know that he is there they do not feel his living breath though to his secret they pretend with instant sweet old souls to mend he goes to hear the grand debate that makes his own religion law but him the members as he sate below the gangway never saw they used his name to serve their end and others left old souls to mend before the church exchange he stands where those who buy and sell him meet he sees the livings changing hands and shakes the dust from off his feet maybe his weary head he bows while from his side fresh ichor flows from mitred peers he turns his face where priests convoked in session plot he would remind them of his grace but for his now too humble lot so his dull cry on ears devout he murmurs sadly from without he goes where judge the law defends and takes the life he can't bestow and soul of sinner recommends to grace above but not below reserving for a fresh surprise whom it shall meet in paradise he goes to meeting where the saint exempts himself from deadly ire but in a strain admired and quaint consigns all others to the fire while of the damned he mocks the howl and on the tinker drops his scowl go here go there they cite his word while he himself is nigh forgot he hears them use the name of lord he present though they know him not though he be there they vision lack and talk of him behind his back such is the church and such the state both set him up and put him down below the houses of debate above the jewels of the crown but when old souls to mend he says they sent him off about his ways he is the humble lowly one in coat of rusty velveteen who to his daily work has gone in sleeves of lawn not ever seen no mitre on his forehead sits his crown is thorny and it pricks on it the dews of mercy shine from heaven at dawn of day they fell and it he wears by right divine like earthly kings if truth they tell and up to heaven the few to send he still cries out old souls to mend End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Potato Bug Exterminators by James McIntyre Read for LibriVox.org by Algy Pug Perth, Western Australia During the summer of 1883, we were walking along past a large field of potatoes in North Oxford, 
where we beheld the strange spectacle of a pair of bipeds drilling their offspring to march up one potato row and down the other, so as to annihilate the enemy who had assembled in vast armies dressed in yellow garments, and who were committing fearful depredations on the fruits of the husbandman, until the valuable auxiliary forces rushed to the rescue of the farmer, overwhelming the enemy, and, with one fell swoop, bringing on them consternation and ruin dire. It appears that the foe, or their progenitors, had been citizens of Colorado in the far west, and that, having conquered all before them, they sought another world to conquer here. When we do trace out nature's laws, and view effects, and muse on cause, for the future there's great hope, if we our eyes do only ope, with joy they will often glisten, if to truth one doth but listen. But people often turn deaf ear, and what is useful will not hear. Now for a minute lend your lugs, our theme, it is potato bugs. Just buy a pair of young pea-fowl, their voice may be like to screech-owl. But soon as a potato shows, you there will find the pea-fowl goes, up one row and down the other, like loving sister with brother. And you will find that down their mugs have disappeared potato bugs. There's no more need of Paris green, for they will keep potatoes clean, and faithful they will work all day. For to them tis gay sport and play. No more you need their voice bewail, But admire beauties of the tale. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Rainbow by Vine Colby Read for LibriVox.org by Heidi Pack Whose doorway was it in the sordid street that gave us shelter from the sudden rain? Two vagrant sparrows on a dripping branch, waiting a moment to spread wing again. The beggar children danced through pavement pools, barefoot and joyous, splashing at their will. The rain washed green that dusty sycamore, and straws swirled wildly down the gutter's rill. Fast breathing from the run, our hands still clasped, we leaned out laughing, shaking free our hair of dewy drops, while still the clouds poured down a freshness that made heavenly the air. Then we both saw, above the sodden world, the rainbow like a miracle appear. And you said, whispering, Oh, kiss me once before it fades. Kiss me then quickly, dear. One warm, sweet touch of lips. Then forth we went, oblivious of all the rain and wet. Today I saw a rainbow after rain. My heart remembered then. Does yours forget? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Service Flag by William Herschel. Read for LibriVox.org by Bill 2147. Dear little flag in the window there, Hung with a tear and a woman's prayer, Child of old glory, born with a star, Oh, what a wonderful flag you are! Blue is your star in its field of white, Dipped in the red that was born of fight, Born of the blood our forebears shed, To raise your mother the flag o'erhead. And now you've come in this frenzied day, To speak from a window, to speak and say, I am the voice of a soldier's son, Gone to be gone till the victory's won. I am the flag of the service, sir, the flag of his mother, I speak for her, who stands by my window and waits and fears, but hides from the others her unwept tears. I am the flag of the wives who wait for the safe return of a martial mate, a mate gone forth where the war god thrives to save from sacrifice other men's wives. I am the flag of the sweethearts true, the often unthought of the sisters too. I am the flag of a mother's son who won't come home till the victory's won. Dear little flag in the window there, hung with a tear and a woman's prayer. Child of old glory, born with a star, oh what a wonderful flag you are. End of poem. This is a recording in the public domain. A Sonnet of the Moon by Charles Best Read for LibriVox.org 
by Natalia Godwin. Look how the pale queen of the silent night doth cause the ocean to attend upon her, and he, as long as she is in his sight, with her full tide is ready her to honor. But when the silver wagon of the moon is mounted up so high he cannot follow, the sea calls home his crystal waves to moan, and with low ebb doth manifest his sorrow. So you, that are the sovereign of my heart, have all my joys attending on your will, my joys low ebbing when you do depart. When you return, their tide my heart doth feel. So, as you come, and as you do depart, joys ebb and flow within my tender heart. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Dancing Girl by James Weldon Johnson Recorded for LibriVox by Tom Merritt Do you know what it is to dance? Perhaps you do know in a fashion. But by dancing I mean not what's generally seen, but dancing of fire and passion, a fire and delirious passion, with a dusky-haired senorita, her dark, misty eyes near your own, and her scarlet red mouth like a rose of the south, the reddest that ever was grown, so close that you catch her quick panting breath as across your own face it is blown, with a sigh and a moan. Ah, that is dancing, as here by the Carib it's known. Now whirling and twirling like furies we go, now soft and caressing and sinuously slow, with an undulating motion like waves on a breeze-kissed ocean, and the scarlet red mouth is nearer your own, and the dark misty eyes still softer have grown. Ah, that is dancing, that is loving, as here by the Carib they're known. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Think Gently of the Erring by Julia Carney Read for LibriVox.org by Laurie Arsenault Think gently of the erring, ye know not of the power With which the dark temptation came in some unguarded hour. Ye may not know how earnestly they struggled, or how well, Until the hour of weakness came, and sadly thus they fell. Think gently of the erring, O oh, do not thou forget, However darkly stained by sin, he is thy brother yet, Heir of the selfsame heritage, child of the selfsame God, He has but stumbled in the path thou hast in weakness trod. Speak gently to the erring, for is it not enough That innocence and peace have gone without thy censure rough? It sure must be a weary lot that sin-stained heart to bear, And those who share a happier fate their chidings well may spare. Speak gently to the erring, thou yet mayst lead them back, With holy words and tones of love, from misery's thorny track. Forget not thou hast often sinned, and sinful yet must be. Deal gently with the erring then, as God has dealt with thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Vitae summa brevis Spem nos vetat in cohare longum by Ernest Dowson. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. The brief sum of life forbids us the hope of enduring long. Horace. They are not long, the weeping and the laughter, love and desire and hate. 
I think they have no portion in us after we pass the gate. They are not long the days of wine and roses. Out of a misty dream our path emerges for a while, then closes within a dream. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wanderer by Zoe Aikens Read for LibriVox.org By Lita Campbell The ships are lying in the bay, The gulls are swinging round their spars. My soul as eagerly as they Desires the margin of the stars. So much do I love wandering, So much I love the sea and sky, That it will be a piteous thing In one small grave to lie. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Warren's Address to the American Soldiers by John Pierpont, read for LibriVox.org, by Bill 2147. Bunker Hill, June 17, 1775. Stand. The ground your own, my braves. Will ye give it up to slaves? Will ye look for greener graves? Hope ye mercy still. What's the mercy despots feel? Hear it in that battle peal, read it, on yon bristling steel, ask it, ye who will. Fear ye foes who kill for hire, will ye to your homes retire? Look behind you, there afire, and before you see who have done it. From the vale on they come, and will ye quail? Leaden rain and iron hail, let their welcome be. In the God of battle's trust, die we may, and die we must. But O work in dust to dust, be consigned so well, as where heaven its dews shall shed on the martyred patriot's bed, and the rocks shall raise their head of his deeds to tell. End of poem. This has been a recording in the public domain.